Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Rafsky, Senior Research Fellow at the Tau Center, and welcome to the panel Deconstructing the News Desert, which is the first webinar in the Tau Center's Redefining the Local News Crisis series. Over the course of three weekly consecutive panels in the coming weeks, we will explore various aspects of the local news crisis, as well as recent research by Tau Center Fellows. This panel will set the groundwork and context for the subsequent two webinars that will touch on issues related to community-centric and partisan local news models. But first, joining me on this panel is Penny Abernathy, Night Chair in Journalism and Digital Media Economics Professor, UNC Husband School of Journalism and Media. Matthew Weber, Associate Professor, Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota. Sarah Stonbelly, Research Director, Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University. And Aaron Foley, the Black and Media Initiative Director at the Center for Community Media at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. This is a really great panel we have here and I'm looking forward to getting diving into discussion with all of these panelists. But before uh, we get started, a bit of housekeeping first. We'll spend the last 10 minutes of our time answering questions from all of you. So please do submit your questions in the Q&A window and we hope to get to as many of those as possible. And if you're so inclined, feel free to identify yourself in those questions. And first, before turning back to our panelists, I'm gonna provide some background to this conversation based on recent Tau research. Uh, to get started, I think if you're attending this event, you probably are at least generally aware of the crisis, uh, economic, technological, and otherwise, that the local news industry has experienced in the 21st century. One that has been, of course, greatly accelerated by the pandemic-induced financial crisis. New research by the Tau Center that came out today tracks in granular and depressing detail the extent of that crisis in the form of layoffs, furloughs, suspension to print publication, and even closures. And I, I recommend you do check out that project, the Tau Center Layoff Tracker, which was published today on our website um, and CJR. So that project builds off now nearly a decade of work that has named, measured, and assessed what's been happening to local news. And that's interestingly taken shape around a number of environmental and ecological metaphors. If you've read any of the research or attended any of the many, many panels on local news, you've likely heard people invoke some of these metaphors like information ecosystems, media landscape studies, and of course, news deserts. But what do these terms really mean and how are they actually measured? From a methodological perspective, that's actually a much trickier question than it may seem. And the answers to these questions greatly impact how we understand what the local news crisis actually looks like for people in communities. Take, for example, the idea of an ecosystem. We use this term commonly in journalism circles to describe ways in which information flows in a community through a network of people, organizations, and institutions, which include professional news outlets, but also potentially libraries, social media platforms, community groups, etc. Healthy news ecosystems, according to the Philanthropic Foundation Democracy Fund, are, quote, diverse, interconnected, sustainable, and deeply engaged with their communities, end quote. I think, personally speaking, sometimes when we allude to ecosystems in a metaphorical sense, we're trying to convey an ecological image of a system of interlocking forces working in harmony and in a state of equilibrium. Whereas in actuality, if you look at the definition in ecological studies, Ecosystems are seen as dynamic entities that are subject to periodic disturbances due to both internal factors as well as feedback loops. And so we're in the process of constantly recovering from past disturbances. I actually think that that aspect of ecosystem, of what an ecosystem is, is particularly apt for our own field of study, perhaps more so than the one of harmony um, and equilibrium. I personally got interested in this question of how do we actually understand what an information ecosystem or news desert is over the course of the last year when researching and publishing reports on local news in my hometown, New York City. New York is the media capital of the world um, and according to research by the CUNY Center for Community and Media, has at least 270 ethnic and community news outlets in addition to the more mainstream print, broadcast, and digital ones. It's clearly not the same as a rural community without a newspaper. However, in recent years, many sectors have noted on the declining quality of local coverage, both quality and quantity of local coverage in the five boroughs. So I was interested in whether you could have something like mini news deserts within a big city and media market like New York City, perhaps geographic based ones or even topic based ones. And over the course of my research um, concluded that yes, in fact, 
clearly certain communities and beats uh, were going underreported, most notably healthcare, um, which when we published our first report in January, seemed like a, a minor detail, but has obviously had serious consequences for local reporting once the pandemic hit in March. Because of this research, I was very interested in speaking with other researchers about how they approach these problems of definitions and methodologies. The term news desert itself dates back to at least 2011 and over the course of the past decade has been expounded upon by the panelists we have assembled here, as well as in other projects like Phil Napoli's News Measures, uh, news Measures Research Project, Michelle Ferrier's The Media Deserts Project, um, and others. But um, since the panelists we have here are all experts on these questions, I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to them now. Um, and they are each going to give overviews of their most recent research, as well as give some insight about how they think um, about definitions of some of these terms like news deserts and even seemingly more basic ones like what is local news and what is a news organization. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over first to Penny Abernathy of UNC. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here with all of my colleagues, all of us who have a passion about uh, both researching this as well as uh, defining it. Um, we just published our most recent uh, fourth report at UNC uh, titled News Deserts and Ghost Newspapers, Will Local News Survive? Um, that will come up on the screen, I believe, um, shortly. Uh, it is a, um, uh, when you're looking at uh, news deserts, I think that uh, are trying to measure either news quality or news quantity, the question always becomes, how do you go about doing it? And for our first report, which we published in 2016, called The Rise of a New Media Baron and the uh, Merging Threat of News Deserts, we focused primarily on ownership of, news, um, of newspapers because of 50 years of research in the academy that had shown that local newspapers had historically been the prime, if not the sole source of news and information uh, that was vital for most residents in a community. That's because television stations and broadcast uh, outlets did not reach down into many of the small and mid-sized communities, whether you defined a community as a um, inner city neighborhood, a suburban uh, area, or as a rural area. So uh, our most recent one tries to involve, uh, incorporate both quantity and quality measures. Uh, the original one basically uh, focused on quantity. How many newspapers did we have in this country? What had been the history over the past decade or so? And who owned them? Because the notion was with the rise of a new media baron, particularly the uh, private equity and hedge funds, uh, that had swooped in to purchase hundreds of newspapers, there was the risk uh, that uh, with a, a primary emphasis on shareholder value, the civic journalism mission would fall by the wayside. And that along with the economic stress of the uh, whole entire news industry, but particularly newspapers as the economic model, model collapsed would threaten uh, the quality of the news. Uh, uh, more recently, in our most recent ones, we've also evolved the definition of a news desert to focus not just on the quality of the news that's available, but also the ability of residents to actually access it. Uh, access it can be, is there a digital connection that allows you to uh, actually join the digital highway and receive that um, the news? And even if there is one, can you actually afford it? Who can afford to pay $200 a month for uh, access to high-speed cable. Uh, we have also evolved in looking at uh, where the, uh, who is getting what and what types of communities are getting uh, the, uh, the information that they need uh, by expanding the, uh, what we define as primary news outlets. Um, one of the things that we uh, noticed immediately is that uh, organizations and communities that are most likely to have lost a news organization, especially a newspaper, are those that are economically struggling communities. In many of these communities, the poverty rate is as much as three times the national average. So if you put together the notion that there's been a collapse of the for-profit model uh, that sustain local newspapers, who is filling the void? So first we added uh, uh, digital, uh, independent digital sites because that was the hope. Uh, unfortunately, what we found in this latest report is that uh, we are 
basically replacing as many as we lost. So we're just kind of treading water in terms of the digital sites that are there. We also added this year both ethnic news outlets and public broadcasting. Unfortunately, what we found, regardless of where we look at uh, uh, news outlets, is that the predominant uh, news outlets are in the metro areas, which leaves large swaths of this country without access to daily information about quality of life news that can affect uh, the decisions that they make, uh, both long term as well as short term. Uh, finally, I want to talk just a little bit about our methodology. Uh, we've, our methodology has evolved. We started out with basically creating a database. We started with national databases such as the one from ENP as well as from um, uh, BIA Kelsey. What we found is because of the lag and how quickly things are changing is that often the data in those databases was anywhere from uh, two to three years old or as much as a 20 to 30 percent error rate when we looked at things like ownership uh, as well as circulation and the a whole range of uh, issues. Uh, we, track, we try to track as many as 10 variables with uh, the newspapers that we have, focusing primarily on circulation, coverage of, the, uh, of certain areas, and where there's overlap and where there is not um, uh, an emergence of, uh, where there is an emergence of uh, a lack of news information. We, we quickly realized that in order to refine the databases, we need to supplement it with an annual survey of press associations. Uh, we, this typically takes about three months uh, where we go through uh, the database, uh, typically in the first and second quarter, and try to uh, connect back with the um, press associations. Uh, we usually pick up a handful uh, each of the states that we were not aware of, that were not carried in any of the major uh, databases. Plus we learn who has been um, closed or uh, uh, changed from daily to weekly going forward. And then the second thing that, that we have uh, th then do is to look at monitoring of daily news articles. Unfortunately, most of the news articles that appear about the closures are usually for dailies or large newspapers. So we have to depend on a pretty extensive monitoring system. And when a news organization is sold, have to actually get in and ask questions about some of the smaller newspapers as to what happens to them. And then finally, what we have to do when we get a list of papers that uh, people write in and suggest or the press associations uh, write in and suggest is we do our own independent research. And what we do is uh, pull on the fine research of Rutgers and Duke around identifying the critical information needs that the FCC identified in 2011-2012 uh, around uh, pieces of information such as education, health, environment, governance, politics that we all need in order to make wise decisions about how we live our lives. And we try to track and see whether this is actually a newspaper whether it's a zone section, whether it's a shopper, whether it's a total market coverage shopper version, uh, um, whether it's a lifestyle magazine that basically does not uh, go heavy on that. Uh, as a result, we often end up with a, a check on newspapers, both of their quality as well as on their quantity. There's a lot that needs to be done to refine this. We admit that we're not, uh, uh, this has been an, an evolution for us, just as our own definition of news desert has changed dramatically to include both access as well as quality and quantity of the news outlets. Uh, I think there is a lot that needs to be done too in the, in, in the next five years that begins to kind of pull together what we are finding across multiple disciplines going forward. But um, for most of us, I think what is exciting about right now is that things are changing very rapidly. There's a wonderful chance for us to kind of use the methodology, use the uh, research that we're doing to answer questions around uh, what is the journalistic mission in the digital age? How do we cover communities that have not been, that have been left behind, as well as dealing with policy issues and uh, business model issues and technology capabilities going forward? Thank you very much, Penny. Uh, we'll move on now to Matt Weber of the University of Minnesota. All right, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the research that my team is leading uh, 
working on building an automated analysis of news localness. And I'll start by giving a little history and background to this project. Um, the work that I'm doing extends out of the 100 Communities Local News Project that Phil Napoli and I started back when we were both faculty at Rutgers University. And it's a project that Phil and I have continued to expand upon and develop in a number of different ways. The 100 Communities Project is focused on analyzing um, local community news coverage um, by looking at a sample of 100 communities across the United States. And we selected those communities by drawing a random sample from communities between 20,000 and 300,000 in population. Um, and you can see on the map that's on the screen, uh, the sample of communities represented um, by the circles. And I'll come back and say a little bit more about this in a bit, but it gives you a sense of the geographic dispersion of communities that we analyzed. In our original research, we looked at 16,000 news stories, and we looked at whether or not the news coverage in these communities was original, whether it was local to the community, whether it served a critical information need. And the FCC defined those critical information needs as um, being information about emergencies, health, education, transportation, um, environment, economics, civic information, and political life. These critical information needs are defined as being core to the functioning of a well-being society within a given community. And so by looking at originality, locality, and critical information needs, we found that we're able to assess the health of news within a given community. Within each of the 100 communities, we collected the stories that were produced by television stations in that community, radio stations, newspapers, and web native news sources. And the idea was, be, was to be able to take a lens to each community to understand not only the news that was produced, but the associated demographic variables that um, comprise that community, um, as well as another uh, number of other variables that we were able to look at that impact the production of local news. For instance, we found that the proximity of a major university increased the likelihood of news that was original or local. Um, the proximity to a large metropolitan market increased the proximity, increased the likelihood that news would be original within a community. A higher proportion of Hispanic and Latino populations decreased the probability that content would be local or that content would be original. And so we were able to start to identify key variables and key levers that impacted content within these communities. Now, one of the core challenges was that when we conducted this original study back in 2018, we looked at 16,000 stories and we looked at them manually. And we realized very quickly that long term, this was not going to be a, a feasible way for us to continue to monitor the health um, of these local communities that we are tracking. We now have data from 2016 through to 2020. We now have more than 55,000 stories that we've collected on these communities and are in the process of developing an automated process for examining the localness of communities. And so the visualization that is on the screen is the first output of this product, um, this project. And I apologize that I don't have a URL ready for this, but we finished this analysis about two days ago. Um, so you're getting a fresh glimpse at new research. And what I can tell you is that what we have now done is we have analyzed our 55,000 stories using um, named entity recognition and big data analysis to look at the language within the stories and to examine the places that are mentioned. And we have now created an index that corresponds to how local the places are that are mentioned in stories within these communities. On average, right in the middle, we find that the majority of communities cover locations that range anywhere between 400 and 600 miles from their home base, from the community that is being covered. And we see that increasingly what is being defined as local is covering a much broader swath of the US than what I think many of us would originally think of or naively think of on our own as local. Um, we're finding that local today is not local to a given community. It's a far broader population, a far broader range than we would expect. 
Um, we found a significant correlation between the rural communities that were included in our study and a breadth, a breadth of coverage, meaning that more rural communities cover much wider distances and have much less local news, um, much less original content. We're finding that when communities are proximal to large major metropolitan markets, the content coverage tends to be more local, in part because, as we hypothesize, uh, the major national reporting is covered by the major daily within that community, uh, within that city. Um, so we're starting to see a number of different trends that play out and in many ways reinforce what Penny was previously talking about as we start to look at automating this analysis. As we move forward, we're going to begin automating uh, content analysis to look at critical information needs within the stories that we're analyzing, as well as um, third, looking at, locale, uh, looking at the originality of the stories that we've analyzed. Um, but the original report that we'll be releasing in the next month or two will focus on localness based on this automated analysis of the 55,000 stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. We'll turn now to Sarah Stonbelly of Montclair State University. Great, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on this excellent panel um, talking about these, these issues in this research that, um, as Penny said, um, is so, so exciting right now because there's so much great work happening. And just as I listen to Penny and Matt speaking, even though I know these projects somewhat intimately, just, it's, I just love how much there's overlap there is and how much um, we're going to be able to build uh, on what everyone else is doing. So that's really great. Um, the latest research project on local news at the Center for Cooperative Media is um, a map, um, a map of all local news providers serving New Jersey, which is where we're based. Um, and then a corresponding structural analysis of um, the features of communities that have, uh, are correlated to robust local news provision or uh, um, to a community being a local news desert. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but what you can see on the screen is our map of New Jersey broken down by municipality. And um, we released this in April. It's at newsecosystems.org. So you can dig into all the different layers that you see on the left. Um, we have, you know, we wanted to count the total number of outlets. And then um, we thought it was really important, um, you know, following Penny and other research that's been done, the Pew 2010 report about Baltimore, to be able to distinguish what we call local news originators, but the newspapers, the newspapers, um, the public media stations with robust local newsrooms. So we have that as well. And that's actually the screen you're looking at. Um, and then as you scroll over each um, municipality, you'll see the name and the outlets that serve and all the different numbers that come up there. And then going down further, we have the different, like I said, structural characteristics of the municipalities, which are based largely on census data and are the ones that you would think, you know, that you'd hypothesize would be correlated to um, the provision of local news. And indeed, um, as we found, they definitely are. Um, so just a couple quick numbers, 779 uh, outlets serving New Jersey, 683 of those are based physically in New Jersey, but because of New Jersey's somewhat unique position between New York and Philadelphia, we have um, about 100 that are based over state lines, but that actually provide local news about New Jersey. Um, and then the local news originator count, those newspapers and public media stations I was talking about, 581 of the 780, of 779. Um, so several points about this research that I want to make that I think are going to be relevant today. Um, the first is that there are, as we've seen, several good mapping projects out there, and it's really exciting. Um, I wanted to also mention Jesse Holcomb, who was a co-author co of mine on this phase of the project. Um, and what we wanted to do at the very beginning was we wanted to be able to comprehensively map local news provision, um, but at scale, which is just ultimately a real challenge for any type of research, but um, especially this mapping research, because um, again, as Penny stated, it's really a quantity versus quality issue. And it's really time intensive and difficult to uh, be able to achieve that level of granularity while also um, providing scale, which of course provides opportunities for comparative analysis and you know, seeing patterns and stuff like that. Um, so that was what we set out to do. Um, so we hope that this method is in some ways a pilot um, that we can that we can test elsewhere, um, you know, and refine as we go. It's always going to be iterated upon. Um, one of the things that we do differently than I think any other mapping project is doing right now is we are mapping outlets based on coverage area. So the same outlet will turn up in several different municipalities, um, geographically adjacent municipalities, and that's slightly, that's different. That's a different emphasis than, than mapping based on where the outlet is physically 
faith-based. And it really does um, kind of shift the lens when you're looking at, um, you know, sort of coverage area versus where outlets are physically based. So that's um, a, a key difference um, that we do here. One caveat to that is we use outlets self-reported coverage areas. So um, almost certainly outlets will over-report their own coverage areas. And the next phase of this project is a content analysis of um, the content produced by every single outlet that we found that has a website. And we're going to be doing um, sort of, I think very similar to what Matt and his team did, where we're trying to figure out which outlet, which towns are they actually covering? Uh, which towns are these local outlets actually covering? And that's really important, right? Because you can have an outlet based somewhere um, and it says it's covering the five adjacent municipalities and it may only be covering one or, or none, who knows, it's getting all its news from New York or wherever. Um, so that's the next step, but that's kind of the caveat to the self, to the coverage areas that we map here. Um, we also make the distinction between, um, as I said, the total number of outlets and the local news originators, um, which we thought was um, important to do and hopefully, and it is, is going to be of use in the analysis that's coming out shortly. Um, but we thought that Penny correctly emphasized um, the newspapers um, in that respect. We thought that that's an important distinction to make. Um, and then also, as Matt and his team did, and as Phil Napoli and others have done, um, looking at the structural characteristics, the socio-political structural characteristics of the municipalities, and trying to link those to to what to the provision of local news, because um, really, what are the levers for change? Um, you know, if not, if, you know, we have to figure out what makes a place have good good local news, what makes it lose a news desert. Um, and then one an, another point is accounting for population. Um, so you'll see on the map as if you go through different layers, um, you know, the, the colors, the shades will change a lot um, based on which layer you're looking at. And it's really important to weight it per population, right? So to use two New, New Jersey examples, um, we care very much if there's a news desert in the middle of Newark, um, we don't care as much if it's a news desert in the Pine Barrens, you know, where no one lives. So we really wanted to make sure that we accounted for um, weighting it for population. So we did that for the local news or originators uh, on this map. And then finally, one of the other things that we came across, um, again, following Penny, is the ownership issue. Um, I was amazed to see, as I was putting together this list, that there are 19 mini conglomerates operating in New Jersey. And they all have between three and 39 outlets with an average of 11 outlets. So small, small conglomerates. Um, and what we've seen, and we saw, I saw in a study for the center in 2017, is that when um, conglomerates take over an outlet, what they tend to do is, you know, slash jobs, um, cut resources, uh, share the content more widely, which might go a long way to explaining why Matt sees, you know, this expansion of the geographical range because they're sharing all this content between outlets and um so really interesting in terms of ownership that's just another piece and it's so opaque i found that it was very difficult to get to the bottom of which outlets were owned by whom um, because they don't make it easy to see that so um that's another part of our project and i'll say more about it as we go on thanks Thank sarah you. thanks very much and finally turning to aaron foley of cuny All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Sarah, for um, hosting me and all of our wonderful panel here. I do not have slides because um, we are in the middle of developing our research for the Black Media Initiative here at CUNY, um, which I can discuss a little bit about what we're trying to do. Our research will probably not show up until later this fall, but the goal of the Black Media Initiative, um, which I started in this position in June, it was announced last December of uh, last year. Um, so we're still kind of fairly new to this discussion, but um, Black media in terms of media outlets that uh, primarily serve an African-American audience, um, but also defining, you know, whether we include Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latino, um, other um, populations within our diaspora, um, because the terminology has for more than a century now um, always been geared towards African Americans. So that's one thing we're trying to define, but also just um, our goal is to elevate um, the purpose of black media and also provide paths to sustainability. 
Um, one thing that is often overlooked in discussions around journalism, um, especially when it comes to community journalism, local journalism is where community media, which is our term for what uh, most would call ethnic media, we're talking black media, Asian media, indigenous media, media Latino media, um, queer media, so on and so forth, um, is that while there's been many discussions around how the economic, the economy has um, altered newsrooms in terms of uh, newsrooms working with smaller staffs, um, less resources, so on and so forth. A lot of our community outlets, especially within black media has been, have been hit twice as hard because they already had small staffs to begin with. Um, so what are, what we're trying to um, assess in the months going forward is one actually putting together a directory of how many black media outlets exist um, whether that is a local outlet like an Amsterdam News in New York or Michigan Chronicle in Detroit or a more national outlet like the undefeated through ESPN the, the Grio, the root BET things like those um, right now there is no comprehensive directory of just how many outlets are so serving local communities so that is one thing we're hoping to accomplish and then the other thing, which um, some of the other things that have been discussed when it comes to community media so far is issues around ownership. There is currently some debate within our community in terms of whether it's good to have a more conglomerate style ownership of uh, maybe one corporation or whatnot that owns multiple black papers. But what does that mean in terms of providing local coverage? But also because black papers have struggled economically for so long whether they could benefit from larger ownership in terms of um, getting their news out there hiring the people that they need to get the news out out there so on and so forth um, a lot of our research will also center um, revenue in terms of one thing we know anecdotally and we've known this for years within black press communities is that larger um, corporations, larger companies, lar we, we all know how the advertising structure works for a local newspaper, your car dealerships, your local chain stores and stuff like that take out the big ads. What we've known anecdotally for years and what we're hoping to um, see more research around is why those same companies do not advertise in black media and what that means for the potential to grow more revenue through advertising in some of these places, because that is the big conversation a lot of the publishers are having. While journalism is definitely our focus at um, the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism and then how we can um, provide the training and the resources for media outlets to produce more robust journalism, something that we're passionate about, especially for community media. Um, many of the publishers are concerned solely with revenue because this is how they pay salaries. This is how they hire. This is how they um, continue to print. Um, one thing that we've seen post pandemic is that a lot of um, outlets were not ready for the pandemic or any sort of catastrophe because we've seen a handful of outlets already continue to print, uh, I mean, produce content digitally, but they've had to shutter their print operations for the first time in, in some cases, more than 50 years or so. Um, there was no contingency plan for something like this. Um, we've also seen that some of these same outlets, their websites, because there has been such a concentration on the print product, their websites are not always that of a more forward facing 2020, uh, you know, something that looks very modern as compared to, you know, the local paper or the, or, or the local news site in town. A lot of them are op maybe operating off of WordPress, something like that. So there are multiple issues that we are dealing with in our community that a lot of this boils down to, again, when we, when we survey some of these outlets, a lot of them have probably less than five people on staff, um, which could work for an all digital outlet, but a lot of these outlets are still producing a print product. So some of these you know, publishers also double as editors, as reporters, as columnists, a lot of the staffs are stretched thin. So that, what does that mean? Well, when you look at communities like Detroit, Minneapolis, Chicago, um, Atlanta, so on and so forth, especially now in, um, in context of 
uh, police brutality, police related shootings, so on and so forth. Um, we've heard anecdotally at CCM incidences where there have been a black news outlet within a community um, that has covered something like a George Floyd and has been had boots on the ground and has had, you know, providing that coverage to the community with the nuance that it needs. But two things happen. One, uh, their coverage is already and has been for many years overlooked by the local, you know, the bigger uh, local news outlets in town, your daily paper, your, you know, regular seven day a week news station, TV station, so on and so forth. But also, you know, on top of that, when a national news, out, news outlet swoops in, you know, a, a larger, like a CNN or New York Times or something like that, and then when these issues that happen, like around the George Floyd or something like that, are explained on a national scale, it is usually filtered or, or magnified through the lens of someone that may not be as familiar with the community. Um, but when it, when it centers a, a Black issue, um, even if um, when we have these conversations about diversity in newsrooms and things like that, um, you know, you look at a city like Detroit, you look at a city like Minneapolis, you look at a city like Chicago, where many of the newsrooms, the, the daily newsrooms are majority white, but missing that nuance because there are not people of color, not many people of color in those new newsrooms. So when a George Floyd happens, um, that, you know, that nuance is lost. Um, and that conversation is overlooked in terms of what service black media provides to the community and how they're not able to perform that service now in 2020 because maybe a pandemic has wiped out their print product or they were not, they did not have the resources and the staff and the number of bodies in the newsroom to really get their message out there um, the way that a mainstream paper could because they've been twice as hard hit by the economic challenges in the last decade plus. So this is all of the things that um, I said earlier that we do not have slides yet because we are in the process of producing our report. But these are the things that we are, we've been seeing, uh, we've been seeing, we've been hearing, and quite frankly, the reason why that we've launched the Black Media Initiative. So happy to take any more questions or thoughts around that. Thanks very much, Erin, and really look forward to seeing that research. Um, well, this was such a great overview to begin with and really impressive research by all of you. I'm now gonna pose a series of questions. I'm gonna pose them to the whole group and whoever wants to answer, please chime in. The first is, um, I'm hoping we can go a bit more into detail about something you all touched on in your presentations, which is the methodologies that you all use. Um, you all spoke a bit about those methodologies as well as in some cases how they've evolved over time. And I was wondering if you could speak in a bit more detail about um, some of the, the benefits, but also limitations of the methodologies you use and also the challenges in those methodologies, whether it's just um, collecting the data or limitations of the methodologies to maybe reflect some of the questions you hope to answer. I know in my work, um, particularly with the layoff tracker project that I mentioned at the middle, at the beginning of the session, we had a number um, of real challenges just tracking down some basic data because of opacity about things like, as Penny mentioned, ownership structure um, and other questions more related to definitions as, you know, what is a local news outlet? Does a shopper qualify, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping um, whoever feels like answering could speak a bit about benefits and limitations of the methodologies you use and the challenges you had um, in using them. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Uh, since, you, since, you, since you mentioned me by name, um, I think that Matt hit on the, the problem. This is very labor intensive. If you look at the back of our contributor page, you usually see dozens of interns that we have uh, had both at the graduate and undergraduate level. So it's not only a matter of creating the database and the trade craft behind the database that you then you do to use the analysis, it's the matter of how you collect it. Uh, I think the interesting thing about what Matt has done is begin to try to use uh, technology and algorithms to help us get at least a general picture I think that though what we found too is that when we go back, that unfortunately algorithms don't measure quality. 
And that is still something where we need to have uh, uh, almost invest the man hours to go back in. So what is the difference between a five inch story uh, in a newspaper that basically says there's a city council meeting that's going to be versus someone who's actually done the in-depth reporting in that paper to uh, talk about what the main issue is that might affect uh, the lives of current residents as well as future residents. So I think there is a real tension in our, um, uh, in our profession between trying to get a, a grasp of what the big picture is, trying to use the technology that we've got available now that we didn't have available 10 years ago to kind of track the general trends, and then, but then also bringing the focus back to the quality. I liked what Aaron said, I liked what Sarah said, and I liked what Matt said about the fact that we really need to focus not just on the number of stories, the number of news outlets, but whether it's actually serving the community with the type of information that it needs uh, for both its businesses and for, for its residences. Yeah, I just wanna, if I could, oh, sorry, if I could build on that um, quickly, I would say that a couple things are coming to mind. And the first is that I mentioned how exciting it is that a lot of our concepts are overlapping. Um, you know, I think we're all using the FCC definition of critical information needs. I think we're all agreeing that newspapers are local news originators. And I think when you're at the beginning of a research genre like this, which I feel like news ecosystems kind of is, it's not, it's better to all be kind of it, iterating in the same direction um, than, you know, trying to in, reinvent the wheel every time or trying to build new theory every time because it is so labor intensive. There are only going to be a limited number of these projects. Um, it would be so nice if we could eventually meld them together somehow um, and, and kind of really like take the strengths of all of them and, and make them into one somehow, someday, well, who knows. But uh, I wanted to say something else about what Penny said, which is that um, there is so much labor involved in building just the list. So if you put news ecosystem research in three buckets, right, you have the production of content, you have the content itself in terms of content analysis, and then you have the audience aspect. Um, just getting a handle on the producers of local content for any given area um, with, you know, the correct amount of nuance and also scale. I mean, it is a huge, huge project. And, um, you know, we too have gone, you have set, several RAs and other people who have helped us. Um, so I think that um, it is methodologically very um, involved. And then you're also, but you're also having to keep this big picture in mind as well. So it's, it's a challenge. So just to give a, a slightly different perspective on methods, I'll give you the real quick technical breakdown and then I'll make a comment um, building on what Penny was talking about. Um, so for all of our data collection from 2016 through 2020, we've partnered with the Internet Archive, um, archive.org, a nonprofit based out of San Francisco to archive and store the local news stories that we're analyzing. We're only pulling web-based content, but we're pulling across media. Uh, we then are utilizing a combination of prepackaged scripts in Python uh, to analyze named entities that exist within stories and then to process the language, natural language processing, to process the text that's within stories. As I said in my presentation, we're really only focused on local right now. There's a caveat to that, um, to Penny's point, we are getting a little bit closer to being able to look at so much quality, but at least being able to code the critical information needs automatically. And we beta tested that um, by looking at a snapshot of 300,000 stories and headlines that were shared by consumers last year via Facebook. And we developed a beta dictionary for the critical information needs and we're able to categorize more than half the stories shared on Facebook as serving a particular type of critical information need. The remaining stories were largely obituaries and sports coverage, um, which does not serve a critical information need, but we made some progress. And um, the other aspect of all of this automated work is that we are sharing our code, um, we are sharing our data, because there is so much data collected in this space that the more we can bring in the collective hive mind, the more we'll be able to advance this work uh, more rapidly. I'll jump in pretty quickly. So. Um, I think the challenge with our method out methodologies in, in, in researching black media is um, one just kind of, I, I know I brought up the term quality, but um, I was also in the mindset of, you know, being, being very cautious about how we define quality because 
one thing we see a lot with um, the, me the media outlets within our community is that um, because, again, going back to the number of people on staff who are able to produce original content, you do see a lot of papers or, or whatever, whatever the content delivery method is um, with just straight up press releases. Not, maybe not 100% of an issue is, press re is all press releases, but you, know, you pick up a paper and it will just be a copy. Well, you know, one article is not really an article, right? It's a copy and paste of a press release, which it may bother some people, especially within our industry, but then for our purposes, we question, but this is still information delivery for a particular audience that may be ignored by a larger paper or what have you. Where do we put this on the scale? So I think that's part of our challenge in turn, one of our, one of our many, many challenges. The other one I'll speak briefly on is um, how exactly do we define local news when it pertains to black communities? So um, our, our typical picture of, of how people get their news is either listening to the radio station, watching a TV report, or getting a newspaper. Um, is a one-man band with a blog spot or, or, or a very lively Twitter feed, you know, is that, is that person a news outlet? Um, but he's covering it from a black perspective. He's covering it from, you know, as it pertains to a black community. Does that, you know, does that Twitter feed count? Um, do hair magazines count as something that, um, because hair can be political, hair can be local news. You know, when you go into a beauty supply or, or something like that and you see imagery of, of, of black people in a publication, is, you know, does this fit also under our umbrella? Does, you know, something that focuses on Black history, not in necessarily Black present, but contextualizes what's going on within our community, is that media? You know, so we have a lot of challenges there in terms of, you know, not just analyzing our weekly papers or our daily papers, as the case may be, you know, what if these papers are an example like uh, The Final Call, which serves a Black Muslim audience, but it's, it's, it, it leans very religious because it serves, um, you know, members of the Nation of Islam. But you go to a city like Detroit, where I'm from, or you go to Chicago, where there are a lot of Black people who live within those two identities, um, but the news may not be straight news. You know, it, it, it strictly pertains to what's going on in the nation of Islam, does that count within our ranks as well? So these are all the questions that, you know, may challenge our traditional methodologies in terms of how we find research. But again, if we are dealing in how media outlets serve specific communities, then how, you know, this is what we'll have to address. Thank you so much. Um, I wondered, this is a little bit of a change of tack, but we, I think all of us are very interested or focus our research on, is it, I guess we're rather journalism organization centric and we focus a lot on from sort of the production side. Um, we haven't talked as much about, you know, distribution or from the consumer side. Um, but I know we, we talked a bit about the, all the different data sets you've collected. I know um, Penny and Matt, you had the opportunity in the past year to work with um, Facebook data, which is often you know somewhat elusive but very desirable from a research perspective and i'm curious um how what your findings were from that data and how that fit in or did not fit into your wider findings um I'd, matt i'd almost like for you to go first and then i'll sure. because you did the big the national picture and then we did the the north carolina picture yeah so I mentioned a little bit previously about this. We were able to access, or we were granted access to a swath of stories that were shared by consumers um, via the, shared, shared by an access by consumers on Facebook um, from last year. Um, we're hopeful that we'll get another crack at Facebook data this year. We're working on that, um, time will tell. But we were able to look at about 300,000 stories that were shared by consumers. And on top of that, um, using a few additional data sets, we were able to match the 300,000 stories up with data about how many likes those stories had received, how many clicks those stories had received, how many shares those stories had received. So we had some information about user attention. Um, 
we found that the majority of stories, almost 50%, fell into the category of either, as I mentioned, sports or obituaries. Um, the other 50% fell into this ca the category of serving a critical information need. And for that 50%, the distribution matched what we had found in our prior research on critical information needs from the 100 community studies. So for what served critical information needs, it matched what we expected. But the downside is that about half the content fell into these kind of uncategorized groups, of more generic content that people click on, that people read, but does not necessarily serve what we consider to be a local news need. It was being categorized as local news by Facebook. We also found that the majority of clicks were going towards content like the sports content, like some of the entertainment content that filtered into our data set. There was a lower distribution of clicks through to the critical information needs. Um, so I, I think that reflects a lot of what we might expect to see on that type of data set. It was useful and important to verify the critical information needs distribution, um, but there's clearly more work to be done in that space. And as I said, we're hopeful that we can get another, another crack at the data so that we can see a, a wider swap. This was a fairly narrow subset of Facebook data and it was a fairly particular subdomain. So to follow up on that, I think this is a classic example of how we can use an, uh, technology and an algorithm to kind of get a big picture. And then we did what we really do need to drill down uh, and take a, a, a different look at what the quality is. So we found when we looked at North Carolina and we took the data from North Carolina, analyzed it using what Matt had had, that basically the categories fell the same way. Uh, however, one of the things that we found is that 50% of the, uh, the stories that met a critical information need were classified as public safety. However, if you looked at what those stories actually were, they tended to be the kind of bizarre crime stories that really don't affect public safety, but because crime is considered a public safety issue, it fell into that, um, into that category. The other main source were, were uh, human interest stories. The other thing that we found when we looked was that many of the local, of the local news feeds included stories from as far away as Houston, Texas for a North Carolina community or were two, two or three days out of date. So for instance, there were hurricane warnings in, uh, on the feeds going through Chapel Hill uh, for the hurricane that was already way out to sea by that point. And it was all related to uh, preparing the airport for the hurricane that never came through Chapel Hill and Raleigh-Durham area. So we also followed it back up with uh, selection from September, our own selection from September and again in April, and we found the same patterns consisted of that. As we were publishing the data, Facebook announced it was merging its local news feed into its regular news feed. Uh, and I think part of it speaks to the issue that Facebook does not generate the news uh, that appears there. They are reliant on our news organizations, and so the paucity of news reflects the loss of local news outlets. We've lost uh, a quarter of our newspapers over the last uh, 15 years. It also, we also matched it against what stories never made the news feed for Facebook and found that quite a bit of the, um, the more in-depth series never gained the traction, the number of shares to make it into a news feed. So I think there's a very interesting dynamic that's going on here. And what I loved was being able to, to uh, tag on to what Matt had done at the national level, but bring it down to a local level. One of the things we're trying this time is that we have tried to use the, um, the, the template that Duke and Rutgers have used and Matt has used in trying to identify what is a critical information need. And we're trying to get actual uh, news consumers to uh, rate their own news uh, organizations based on how well they cover those eight critical information needs. What kind of, and what kind of coverage they actually are giving? Is it just an announcement or is it something that actually uh, it gives you an additional insight into it? So I think we're going to have to bring in uh, more um, inputs back to the point I think Aaron was making as to how we expand and, and think about what is valuable news and uh, is it actually resonating with the consumers that are, that are receiving the news? Thanks, Penny. I'm going to turn to the Q&A now and um, 
with an eye to our time limit, I am going to apologies, combine um, some questions and questions that were posed to specific panelists, um, pose them to the entire group of panelists. But we have a number of questions asking about where specific kind of outlets such as public radio stations, student newspapers, or more broadly nonprofit news outlets um, fit into the future of local news. Do any of our panelists have any thoughts on any of these um, kinds of new, news outlets or other kinds of news outlets? I'll give a real quick answer on universities. Um, in the 100 communities work and again in the ongoing automated work, the mm -hmm. presence of a university has a significant and positive effect on the um, likelihood that you'll have original reporting and local reporting. And we see that tied to the presence of the college paper, as well as to the presence of journalists who are moving out from those papers onto other outlets to work as reporters. So that clearly does have an effect. And I know there are others beyond this panel who are looking specifically at the role that college journalism can play in helping to supplement local news. Yeah, I wanted to, I saw that question uh, in the Q&A as well, and it's a really good point. The public uh, radio stations, uh, I think the, I think it was Jan Schaefer, um, are adding to their newsrooms and do have really robust provision of, of local news. Um, we, we counted them, we counted uh, college newspapers, university newspapers, we counted ethnic media, um, we also counted nonprofits. Um, so I think it's really important in an ecosystem study, especially to try to account for as many different kinds of information providers. And then again, to what Aaron was talking about, um, you know, making the distinction between those outlets um, can be tricky, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitional work and ultimately you have to draw the line somewhere. Um, but I think, the, I think the definition we ended up using, which I think served us well, was um, does, this inf does this outlet provide uh, multi-sourced, fact-based um, stories that are for a general audience or some sort of audience beyond just a, an individual person or a niche audience? And so I think in ecosystem study especially, it's important to keep an eye toward all those different providers. Thanks. If I can, if I can just say one word about uh, college newspapers, since I, I, I presume we have a few folks connected to those worlds in the room. Um, one issue that is not always talked about that, but um, a colleague of mine uh, has brought up is um, diversity in college newspapers matters just as well. And what we've seen is that if there's a pipeline from, as we talk about like, um, you know, how, how do we build pipelines early on from at the scholastic level to bring people into the professional level, where there's a gap is like, let's say you have a high school program that is, you know, specifically designed to target, you know, budding journalists of color. Um, so that, you know, five, 10 years down the line that they're, they're, they're at a local paper or a TV station where the gap is, is college media um, in terms of those hiring decisions, in terms of recruitment, all of that type of stuff. And so what we're seeing now, um, not every school, but definitely, you know, just as much as we have majority white newsrooms in metro areas, we also have majority white newsrooms on college campuses. And what does that mean for when it's internship season and folks are applying, well, you draw your, you know, again, the metro papers and things like that end up drawing from mostly white pools. So something to keep in mind in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what can be done off the top of my head to encourage more diversity at college media, but that is one thing that kind of gets lost in the conversation in terms of diversity of media period. Uh, let me, let me, can I just answer one more question and, and pull it back to both the nonprofit and the um, uh, public broadcasting too. I, I want to focus on one statistic that Pew put out last year, and that is that we have lost more than half of all the re uh, reporters and journalists we had on newspapers over the last 10 years. That's 35,000. Uh, so, you know, if you think about what the issue is for nonprofit organizations, especially the digital startups, as well as public broadcasting, public broadcasting is added about a thousand, that's 3,000, that doesn't begin, that's about a tenth of replacing what has been lost. The same with nonprofit, most nonprofit organizations tend to have two or three or four reporters when you've often lost 30 or more out of a newsroom. So the real key is what issues do you focus on and how do you focus on it geographically? Is it at the local level 
or is it at the state and regional level where you can do the most good? And I think that's the real issue that confronts both nonprofit as well as a public broadcasting as they try to fill the void is how do they best fill it and is it focused at a state and regional level where they can cover the large topics that uh, like health, like uh, environment, like uh, education, uh, that affects more than just a re, uh, residence in the single community. And that's, I think, the real challenge going forward. Thanks. I, I'm aware we're at 1 p.m. I'm gonna take my moderator privilege and go just a little bit over because we have a bunch of questions in the chat about methodology, which is a focus of this panel. So I'm gonna try to combine them all at once. We have a question about, for researchers coding content using critical information needs, could you describe your coding scheme? Some of the critical information need categories are very broad. Um, how do we know if local news outlets are doing a good job and how much local news versus non-local news is necessary? Does the relative localness vary between original content and non-original content? And then how do you classify, let's say, for example, a county is lacking a newspaper or another kind of news outlet, but which are covered by outlets in nearby or adjacent counties? And then lastly, we have a question um, for people using data analysis, data analysis processes, um, what software apps useful platforms um, do you recommend for beginners? It's a lot, I know. <laughs> I mean, I know Matt can speak to this as much or better as, than I can, but to code the critical information needs, um, there's a lot of intercoder reliability testing. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't know about your um, automated con uh, content analysis, but I think, um, you know, there are certain, I mean, you have to have a good definition, of course, and then, you know, you just test it. You have them code a certain sample and then you test it against each other's answers and talk through the ones that are uh, not agreed upon and figured out from there. Um, but I think actually for this type of analysis, the automated stuff is going to be more interesting. So Matt, I'm going to let you answer that one. And we've been spending a lot of time trying to verify our automated coding scheme. Um, verifying and testing the reliability of the automated natural language processing of critical information needs is something that's particularly challenging. We are using the dictionary that was established by manually coding the 16,000 stories as a way to get jump started on that, and that's proved really useful. Um, but to the question of coding scheme, um, that's coming from Jonathan Anderson, who is a upcoming local news researcher at University of Minnesota, so I know where the question's coming from. We're more than happy to share our coding scheme with anyone who's interested. We published the original coding scheme um, with our 100 Communities report, but if anyone wants to reach out, I'm happy to email an updated version of that coding scheme. Um, to the question about getting started with this, um, there are a lot of basic um, you know, computational social science courses that are available through sites like Coursera, and I think those are all a great starting point. Um, for me, I always point my students to R as a core tool that you need to be familiar with and the tidy text package, which has a lot of documentation available, is a really easy way to get your feet wet in the space. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to point to other resources that are useful, but that's my starting point. Thanks all. I'm sorry, I have, I'm going to give one more last question and, and then I'll let you all go. Um, we have a question um, from one of our panelists in our future panels um, in this series that asks um, from Latrell Crittenden, many, BIP many BIPOC communities exist in suburban and rural communities hit hardest by layoffs. These communities were underserved even before they found themselves within deserts. Uh, what can be done to serve their information needs or what information do you need to specifically study these populations in more isolated ecosystems? I can very quickly um, talk about what we're doing. So one thing I, I, I neglected to mention is that we're looking, uh, we're also, you know, not, we're, we're not just trying to put together a directory of where black media exists, but also looking at where black media was lost. So um, a number of the directories that we were working with, that we started working with, you know, you just go down the list and we've seen even prior to the pandemic, a lot of these places went out of business for various reasons obviously creating um, wider news deserts um, among specific communities uh, that have, you know, existed for quite some time, but, you know, just are not talked about outside of those communities. One thing, one idea I'd like to see um, 
um, executed more is when we do see startups, um, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, some, when, you know, a, 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 a fantastic group of folks come together, get a bunch of funding and, and launch something new. Um, in, in, it, it's all geared toward hyper-local, which is outstanding. We love hyper-local news and it serves a need, but um, Black media has always been hyper-local. And sometimes that label does not get applied to community media, ethnic media, whatever your preferred term may be. Um, when we do talk about those funding opportunities, when we do talk about um, where a lot of those grants are going and so forth, where a lot of the, these innovative techniques um, are being executed. So um, I think that could be potentially one solution. I think quite often about cities that, um, you know, you have your major metros like Detroit, Chicago, Atlanta, so on and so forth, but then you may have that suburb or town 40 miles east that, um, um, I, I use Ypsilanti as the example of this. It's the, it's the town that is 40 miles west of Detroit that was, had its own newspaper um, that was eventually bought by the, a larger chain of newspapers. Um, and then a lot of the coverage of Ypsilanti was lost, the Daily City Hall coverage, so on and so forth, as um, the larger paper in Ann Arbor started going online and going digital only and stuff like that. But then Ypsilanti also has a 40% Black population. Um, you know, it's not a town off the side of the road. It's a college town. It's, um, it's an industry town. It's a factory town. You know, there's, there's, there are people there that are willing to pay for news. Um, but they, they do not have, um, there's not always something there to sustain that need. So all of these great new things where, like I said, you know, there's, it seems like in Chicago, there's always like something new that comes up every six months. Um, I, I would like to see more um, stuff like that, that um, targets um, those um, communities, communities of color, not just in the major metros, but all around. Thanks so much. Uh, Really quick plug for the centers, uh, Center for Cooperative Media South Jersey Information Equity Project. Um, this is um, targeting with research and information needs assessment and interviews um, black communities in South Jersey um, and Camden area, which are um, historically underserved, but also seeing some interesting new projects happening. So we're kind of trying to do the mapping project on a very local scale, and that should be coming out sometime in the fall. So, so I think along the lines that the questioner was asking. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I wish we had more time to answer all of these, the great questions I'm seeing in the Q&A. I will just say I see seeds of future research projects in there. People are asking about, for example, coverage of the pandemic in local news, uh, how the methodology that you all use can be applied internationally. These are all questions that need to be answered. And I'm sure um, as this field of scholarship grows, we'll start to see answers to those questions. And I look forward to seeing all of your research as well. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Please do check. Uh, Check out our next webinar next week, same time next Wednesday at noon, uh, where we have a great group of panelists who will be discussing community-centric models for local news. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.